Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Happy Aloha Friday and welcome to a brand new episode of Perspectives on Global Justice, Think Tech Hawaii. This is your host, Beatrice Cantelmo. Approximately 0.7% of the U.S. population is behind bars. This makes the U.S. the country that has the most incarcerated people of all developed countries in the world. All the states are shrinking their prison population, in part due to investment of community-based restorative programs rather than continuing to use a punitive and outdated criminal justice system model. Where is Hawaii in this process? Data from the Department of Public Safety indicates that from 1978 to 2014, <coughs> The Hawaiian prison population has increased 654%. Yes, you heard it right. Such increase is largely driven by heavier penalties from non-violent offenses. As of July of 2017, 999 of the people, also 72% of the people in prison at OCCC, were classified as a community or, or minimum custody level. When we look at the total number of individuals who are under custody at OCCC and their classification levels, these are the findings. A community would be 879 individuals, and minimum offences would be 120 individuals, and that medium security would be 394 individuals, and the maximum security, three individuals. One in three people incarcerated at OCCC were homeless at the time of their arrest. That was a total of 465 people. And at the end of November of 2017, 14% of the population at OCCC were women. 60% of OCCC's population is between the ages of 18 and 39 years old. This is how much it costs to imprison a person in the state of Hawaii. $145 a day, or $4,350 per month, or $52,000 per year. And data from the Department of Public Safety, again, also indicates that the Hawaiians and part Hawaiians are significantly overrepresented in the prison population. 38.4% of the population are Native Hawaiians and all part Hawaiian. And this number also represents 26% of the general uh, Hawaiian population. So, in other words, one in four Native Hawaiians are in jail or prison. It is important to mention that one out of three incarcerated individuals at OCCC were houseless at the time of their arrest. We have a long ways to go until we can become a state that transitions from a punitive model into a rehabilitative criminal justice system. And as criminal justice advocates plead for a comprehensive review of Hawaii state's justice system policies, and practices from the Hawaii state legislators and implement the much needed reforms that can address mass incarceration in the state of Hawaii and uh, uh, overrepresentation of Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander individuals in the Hawaiian criminal justice system on the Hawaii prison conditions, uh, harsh mandatory minimum sentences, on the discriminatory profiling by law enforcement in the state of Hawaii on the unnecessary and excessive use of force and brutality used by law enforcement in the state of Hawaii, on the law enforcement corruption and misconduct issues in the state of Hawaii, and racial and economic disparities that exist at every stage of the Hawaiian criminal justice system. In that, we also need to deal with Hawaiian school to prison pipeline educational and disciplinary policies that send our youth to our criminal justice system and severe solitary confinement use in the state of Hawaii, and overcharging and oversentencing disparities impacting Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders. Well, on that note, today we are very gifted with the presence of a very special guest, attorney Kerry Vacho. He is a criminal defense attorney, and for the past 28 years, uh, he has uh, his practice in the state of Hawaii for 12. And uh, um, we are very fortunate to have you here. So thank you so much. Thank you, Beatrice, for inviting me to be here. Absolutely. So, well, not very gory uh, details and data, um, but I wanted to make sure that we had someone of your caliber, not only in terms of criminal uh, defense 
uh, law experience, but also uh, somebody who has been in the front line, um, you know, for almost three decades, you know, yeah. doing this work. So to our viewers who do not know about you, just tell us a little bit about your background. Where do you come from? Where did you grow up? Uh, and uh, um, how did you decide to become an attorney? <laughs> well, uh, briefly, um, my dad was in the military, and uh, I, I lived all over the United States. Mm -hmm. And um, actually, I was a little boy here in Oahu. And as I grew up, Hawaii was always part of our life. Even when my dad was stationed in Kansas, we had Hawaiian nights and uh, food. And, so how um, was that book uh, in Kansas and Hawaiian nights? <laughs> well, that was very interesting. My dad would put up the tiki lamps and make a, the, you know, get up the pineapples and make meals. It was really a lot of fun as a kid, but uh, it, that always stayed with me. And my mom always used to say, my lay will return. And so um, after I, I actually was a newspaper reporter after college for about six years. Mm -hmm. So what did you do as a reporter? Like, did you focus on a specific area? Well, I did a lot of uh, criminal and uh, political news as a newspaper reporter, both in Oregon and in Alaska. And, but I, my heart had always been, you know, interested in doing criminal defense because of the constitutional issues involved and also with, you know, helping people out. And so I decided to go to law school uh, and left journalism and then have been happy ever since, you know, doing that. I practiced in Seattle, King County. Right. So how long were, For a while. Uh, were you in King County? Uh, on, did you start with private practice or did you start no. as a public defender? I actually was a public defender in Seattle, King County and with the Associated Counsel for the Accused and did that for about 17 years. And then I decided to make the spring and come back to, come to Hawaii. I'd been coming back and forth quite some time by then and set up my own private practice on Maui. And so I've been in private practice in Hawaii for the last um, almost 12 years. Right, so, uh, so you had almost 17 years under your belt yep. as a criminal defense attorney uh, that gave you a very strong foundation uh, to actually, you know, say, okay, I'm going to do this transition and do uh, private practice. Right. And uh, do you do sole pri pri uh, private practice or do you take court appointed cases? Well, I actually do cases? both. Most of my practice is in state court in Maui, but I do other islands as well. Mm -hmm. And also practice in federal court, and in both places, I take court. When the judges ask me, I'm happy to help out with doing court-appointed cases as well in state case and also in federal court. So, okay, so you've been a public defender for almost 17 years. You definitely paid your dues in terms of uh, uh, providing, you know, that social justice, you know, backbone to the system, and so decide to do your private practice. But what is it about? Um, you know, your decision to continue to also serve uh, those who otherwise would not have had representation without a court-appointed case. What is it that's appealing to you? Why do you still do it? Well, I think the most important role of a criminal defense attorney is keeping the system honest, keeping the cops in check, keeping prosecutors from overcharging stuff, and also just a genuine I think most criminal defense attorneys that I know have a genuine concern, a passion in their heart to want to help people. And the people we help is often, I get questions all the time, how can you do that, that work? But actually, a lot of the times that I'm helping people out, it's, it could be my neighbor, it could be an you know, acquaintance, it could be a person down the street just happened to get in trouble, either because of substance abuse issues or poor choices. Right. So uh, let's talk a little bit about that because uh, I know that uh, our criminal defense law is not for the faint of the heart. Uh, there's a lot of judgment, there's a lot of the assumption that people are guilty is charged. Mm -hmm. Which, what do you find in your practice? You know, uh, are people really guilty as charged? Are there issues with over uh, overcharging and over sentencing? Um, not just in the state of Hawaii, but like, you know, what was your experience also as a criminal defense attorney in King County, Seattle? I would say, um, I think that most of my peers would agree with, with me in saying that, you know, the police make mistakes, mm -hmm. and then that gets sent up to the prosecutor's office, and it takes a life of its own. And someone can be falsely accused or falsely charged, uh, and it takes a while for the defense attorney to be able to get that other side of the story to the prosecutor's office and see if we can't get the, the charges dismissed or the charges reduced. Mm -hmm. 
most cases, there's something that happened. It just may not be what the police said or what the prosecutors think it is. And so a lot of the work that a criminal defense attorney is actually involved in negotiating the case with the prosecutors, seeing if we can, and then talking and helping the client out, seeing what the client wants, to, what they hope will happen in their case, and then hopefully getting them either out of jail or back home and with their family uh, with a minimum of consequences that they have to face. So let's talk a little bit about that because I think that a lot of people have this misconception that a criminal defense attorney will try to get somebody uh, get out of jail free card uh, or that people don't have to be accountable. And uh, uh, just a couple of minutes ago, you were mentioning uh, big social uh, issues that we deal in any state, in any society in the world, mm -hmm. such as <clears throat> mental health. Uh, and substance abuse issues. And so when you talk about, uh, you know, how do you really mitigate uh, not only, uh, you know, perhaps a crime that might have been, you know, allegedly, you know, a part of the case, but also uh, making sure that there is some advocacy and considerations for that person to be in rehabilitated programs that will really not only address the core issues mm -hmm. of what perhaps might have contributed to them to, com you know, allegedly commit a crime in the first place, but also to, uh, you know, be rehabilitated and be able to uh, be reintegrated in society after they uh, serve their sentence, or if they, you know, if they go through a probationary period. Okay. Yeah. There's, a little there's, bad. there's yeah. several ways of approaching that. And fortunately in Hawaii, I would say close to over 90 some percent of my cases, there's a methamphetamine addiction, whether it's a property crime, a burglary, a theft, a car break in. We see a lot of, you know, tourist cars being broken in and almost all of those cases, you know, there's driven by an addiction. Usually it's methamphetamine. We're starting to see heroin addiction in Hawaii now, in Oahu and also in my federal cases. And it's starting to hit some of the outer islands. I had a couple of cases now coming into Maui, for example. Um, one thing that Hawaii does very well at the state level is they have drug court programs in each of the islands. In fact, in, and they've just expanded it in Maui, for example. For example, if you have a fourth DUI or a third DUI, because a fourth DUI in the state of Hawaii is a felony and carries up to five years in state prison, but you can go to the drug court program and for most people, it takes about 18 months to complete a drug court program. And when they graduate, uh, the case can be dismissed. Or if they win as an, a probation violation, then their probation is terminated. But the goal is intensive treatment to help that person get back to a situation where they can live a normal life and be free of doing the substance abuse addiction, whether it's methamphetamine, cocaine, alcohol, or whatever. So I think our state has done a, a really good job of making that model available to a lot of our clients who want to get help for a substance abuse addiction. Um, otherwise, if we're not going down that track, then we're going down either the track in which we're trying to get clients' um, charges dismissed or they're, they're being reduced, and that takes a lot of work in terms of being the interviewing the client, talking to witnesses, because witnesses make mistakes. You know, they, they think they may have seen someone done something, but it, they may have identified the wrong person or it got exaggerated as to what happened. And so the, a big role of the criminal defense attorney is to get the client's story that helps that client to the prosecutor. You rarely see anybody getting a just get out of jail free card and a case being dismissed without a defense attorney doing a lot of work to get help get that person's story there. For example, uh, we recently had a, a trial in Maui that was attempted murder. Uh, we finally got uh, not guilty, but we had to get it from a jury because the prosecutors were not willing to compromise on the case or reduce the charges or dismiss it. And the, the and person why, ended up why, staying in jail for over a year until so we got there. I, we're going to take a quick break. Okay. On the, right back. Okay. Sounds good. Hi, my name is Bill Sharp, host of Asian Review, coming to you from Honolulu, Hawaii, right here in the center of the Pacific Ocean. Asian Review is the oldest of the 35 or so shows um, uh, broadcast by ThinkTech Hawaii. We've been in production since 2009. Our goal is to provide you, the viewer, with information, breaking information about events in Asia. Asia being anything from Hawaii west to Pakistan, from the Russian uh, Far East, south to Australia and New Zealand. 
We hope to see you every Monday afternoon at 5 p.m. I'm Jay Fidel, ThinkTech. ThinkTech loves energy. I'm the host of Mina, Marco, and Me, which is Mina Morita, former chair of the PUC, former legislator, and uh, Energy Dynamics, a consulting organization in energy. Marco Mangelsdorf is the CEO of ProVision Solar in Hilo. Every two weeks, we talk about energy, everything about energy. Come around and watch us. We're on at noon on Mondays, every two weeks on ThinkTech. Aloha. Aloha. Welcome back to Perspectives on Global Justice. Think Tech Hawaii. This is your host, Beatrice Contamo, and uh, we are back with uh, Thank you, Beatrice. the defense attorney, Kerry Vachu. So, as you were saying. <laughs> yes, I wanted to mention something. One of the issues that we have a major problem in the state of Hawaii it's pretrial detention. We have an inordinate number of people that are being held in custody, and you mentioned in your opening statement uh, about the number of people being in jail, and it's driven by economics. Uh, in the large part, and also some of it is what's being charged. There are things in work which, which could help alleviate jail crowding. I have clients that have to sh uh, share a, a jail cell with three or four other people for a cell that's only built for two people or three and they're sleeping on the floor. It doesn't need to be this way. And, and they just started in Maui, for example, in the juvenile department, allowing some of the teenagers who come into the system to go home to their family with electronic monitoring. That's a bracelet a person wears on their ankle. In federal court, that's done quite extensively mm -hmm. with, with cases that qualify. So someone doesn't take up a jail space at $145 a day, as you mentioned right. earlier. And especially if that person is not really at high risk to society. Correct. Yeah. And I'd like to see that expanded into the misdemeanor and into the circuit court in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And I think there's been talk about doing it. There was a, a, a committee in, that was meeting in Oahu about bail reform. Mm -hmm. There's many aspects to that. Uh, one of them that they could do to help alleviate jail crowding is initiate, for example, the electronic monitoring I just mentioned for adults. Those are people ages 18 to whether a senior citizen. Another area that I think should be addressed is the bail bond system. In Hawaii, we have a two-court system. We have the state courts and we have the federal national court system. Mm -hmm. At the federal court level, there's no bail bond. So if you get in trouble by the police and they say, hey, in order to get out of jail, you have to post you know, $20,000 bail or post 10% with a bail bondsman. Uh, in federal court, what you do is you sign, you, you don't, they don't use the bail bond system. You you know, there's a hearing with the, you know, the magistrate or the U.S. District Court judge, and um, you can sign an unsecured bond and you're released from custody to go home to your thing. In Hawaii, if you don't have that 10% with a private bail bonding company, you stay in jail, whether it's a trespass case or a minor theft case or, or, something, uh, major. or something even major. And, you know, I think that a lot of attorneys that practice criminal defense, that's not fair because it's, if you're rich, you get out of jail. But if you're you know, if you're poor and can't afford it, you're stuck in custody. Right. And not only that, uh, in addition to being stuck in, in, in jail or prison, uh, there is also so much of that cost also uh, that's reabsorbed by the community and taxpayers. Right. This person could have perhaps continued to do work or start, you know, addressing uh, mental health or substance abuse issues or all right. the issues that, you know, they could have gain the more transferable skills uh, that would, you know, really help. You well, know. there's another cost, too, and that is families are separated. For example, yes. the jail crowding so bad on some of the outer islands in Maui I'm quite familiar with is that some of our clients are being shipped to Oahu. The state then pays to house them at the federal detention center, which is by the airport, or at OCCC. And in some cases, the clients are sent to Halava State Prison, which is not even meant for pretrial detainees. It's meant for people that have been sentenced to more than a year in prison right. uh, to go there. And then there's another cost in a different. So that means families are being, who particularly families who are on the outer islands, are being separated from their loved ones mm -hmm. because it's expensive to fly over yeah. to Oahu to see them. And if you're a, um, a teenager, and you get in trouble. For example, the only detention center for a, a young person a, between 12 and 18 is at Kapale, which is on Oahu. Mm -hmm. So one, um, I'm hopeful that by using electronic monitoring, we'll see less of our youth being shipped to Oahu, which means they're away from their mom, their uncles, their auntie, and would be able to stay on island to be closer to family. Right. So, um, yeah, we touched the base on the, mm -hmm. the, the you know, reality of what we are faced with you know, as a criminal justice system here, why? Yeah. And, uh, you know, it boils down to a lot of times uh, money, mm -hmm. 
the privilege of money that will open doors you know, and opportunities right. for different ways. And uh, I guess the question I have for you, and I know this is really hard sometimes to touch base on it because nobody really, really wants to you know, address this issue, but when you were a public defender in King County, Seattle, mm -hmm. for example, uh, versus now that you are a private you know, criminal defense attorney. When you think in terms, not maybe in terms of case law, because I imagine you, know, you might have continued you know, the same way, but when you think in terms of resources that you have available to be that advocate for, you know, on behalf of a client you know, about what the situation is and what the options that the client has, do you think that there is a big difference um, you know, between when you do criminal law as a public defender versus um, as you know, a private criminal defense attorney? It depends on the office and the individual. I have seen um, their public defenders do terrific work, and, mm -hmm. uh, and I've seen some really excellent work done by public defenders that win a thousand percent for their clients. Mm -hmm. And they don't have to worry about paying the office bills and stuff like that and de dedicate their whole life to it. Um, I've also seen the situation where, you know, um, that hasn't happened. I think this as a private attorney, um, one of the things I really enjoy being in private attorney myself is as soon as someone comes in the door, whether, you know, it's a Saturday or Sunday or a weekday, if they need to get in touch with me, I'm going to call them back, talk to them. We need to get down to the jail, see them at the jail. Uh, and public defenders can do that too, but it, you know, it depends on the office and where I practice. Now, where I practice public defense in Seattle, King County, that was one of the top, top public defense firms that I've ever experienced or seen, and it was really well run. I think there's a lot of, I think in Hawaii, we have a good public defender system as well, but like all public defender systems, they get overwhelmed with caseload. In mm -hmm. fact, one of the national dialogues going on right now and some of the ca cases that are going on is, you know, is it fair to the clients to have a public defender that might have to do 200 felonies a year when really they should only be doing 120 cases a year? Because, you know, you, there's only so much that any individual can do. Right. But if the, if the state isn't willing to pay for a good public defender system, then what's going to happen is the, the system breaks down. You have people with really good hearts that want to do a good job simply getting overloaded. Mm -hmm. Simply not being able to get down there, now it's a private out. And, yeah. and burnt out. Now, as a private attorney, I have more control over my caseload, so hopefully, you know, I'm not in that situation myself. But and uh, and so, um, it really depends on the situation and and the persons involved. But I would like to see um, the state of Hawaii put more money into the public defender system, and and help help them uh, really in, in increase the quality of service they provide. Right, and provide them all that support uh, also for public defenders so that they can really continue to do, you know, what their hearts believe in, but really with the infrastructure, the foundation that will help them thrive and they will, you know, help their clients as mm -hmm. opposed to just soak the life out of them and just say, yeah, it's 200, you know, felony cases a year, I'll deal with it. Right. Uh, so do you see a difference uh, in terms of, um, criminal defense between federal and state uh, criminal cases? There's a huge difference, not so much in how attorneys practice, but in, in the type of law. For example, in, in, in federal court, it's a national legal system, yes. and what it has is the, they don't have parole, for example, in the federal system. In the state case, for example, if my client gets sentenced to 10 years at Halava or a state prison, you have a second hearing to go to, which is with the parole board, uh, six months after sentencing where you can ask the person to get out of jail less than, you know, the 10 years, maybe less than even half that time. So you get a second bite at the apple of trying to get a person resentenced and get back home to community. In the federal system, you don't have that luxury. If your person is, is um, for example, is convicted of methamphetamine and it's 50 grams or more, the mandatory minimum in the states, in the federal system, is 10 years to life. Mm -hmm. If you have prior drug conviction, it's going to be 20 years to life. And you don't get good time, you don't get parole, you're going to serve almost every day of that 10 years that you're sentenced to. And so now, it's a far harsher system. Yeah. And now with uh, the Trump administration right. and the culture of being harsher on uh, 
you know, drugs. Mm -hmm. and I think the situation is even worse. Well, it is because, you know, Jeff Sessions, the U.S. Attorney General, is putting a push out, to put an order out to all the U.S. attorneys throughout the nation to try and charge the most they can, don't, you know, negotiate cases, and try and sentence people to ridiculous amounts of time, you know, as much as they can get. And it's just, it's just terrible because it completely brought to a halt the sentencing reform discussions that were going on in Congress and have basically come to a stop at this point. And, uh, you know, I think it's really hard to not think about um, what is behind uh, uh, the policies that we have already in place and that's been supplemented by this new administration and not to think about the profit margin that it is to actually incarcerate people. Uh, so there is, you know, private uh, jail system. There is a business behind that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think it takes a big commitment, I think, as a nation, uh, not only, you know, as constituents, but also government to say, we need to do that shift uh, so that we can actually invest in the human being, uh, so that that person can have the tools and uh, the foundation to be able to fulfill you know, their life legacy, you know, as opposed to being in jail for, you know, most of their lives, mm -hmm. and especially if they are real offenders, you know. Right. So, um, you know, kudos to you to uh, continue to, you know, believe uh, in, in justice and, and in restorative uh, criminal justice in the system. So when you wake up in the morning, mm -hmm. What drives you to say, I'm going to go and I'm going to walk 14 hour days, even though like I've, you know, I've earned my, you know, my belt and I've been doing this for almost 30 years. What gets you going? I just, seriously, I know it's, it might sound a little corny, but I honestly like to see justice done where someone is, is set free and they get to go home to their family. That is the, that is. A real, I think most criminal defense attorneys would be pleased with that, and also particularly if you can go to court and get a case dismissed right off mm -hmm. the bat. Mm -hmm. so. If everything is conducive to that, right. too, right? And so uh, I can't believe that we are, yeah. you know, so close to our end. But um, I have one last question for you. Yes. Actually, two questions, uh, very quickly. If you had a magic wand and uh, you could change anything, in the federal and in the state and uh, you know criminal justice system in Hawaii, what would that be? And if you could share one pearl of wisdom or a few to perhaps a new you know person who's in law school who may be considering criminal defense uh, as practice, uh, or even with people who you know are already in the trenches and they're like, I'm going to switch to like mm -hmm. you know a patent or you know family law because like this is just too hard. What would that be? In the federal system, I would advocate for getting rid of the mandatory minimum sentencing on drug cases because it is harsh. It is really harsh. I see folks that are basically have an addiction, but they're not criminals being going away for 10 or more years, and that's, that's wrong. So I, that would be in the state system. I'd like to see a lot more funding into mental health programs and into substance abuse addiction issues to help our clients out because mental health is a oh, unfortunately, the criminal justice system is also a backup for the mentally health people who don't get treatment and they wind up in jail and then through the criminal justice system get something. So I'd like to see, you know, the legislature put more money into uh, rehabilitation programs like in mental health and also in uh, drug substance abuse programs for sure. Um, and then your other question was? Uh, the pearl of wisdom to a new law student or attorney who's considering, you know, criminal defense uh, law. Or oh, somebody who might be, you know, in the trenches and burned out. <laughs> well, remember that you're keeping the system honest. No matter how hard it may look or how tough it may get on certain days, the criminal defense attorney is the only person in our Constitution system that helps keep the police in check from overcharging, overstepping their authority, and helps keep prosecutors at bay because otherwise they'd run amuck over our clients. Well. I have no. so much uh, gratitude uh, and uh, uh, respect uh, for you as a professional and also as my mentor <laughs> and, uh, you know, as my boss. I have learned so much uh, from you in this, you know, 17 months, you know, journey. It's not easy, but, you know, 
I think for me, who have a streak in uh, social justice, you know, I cannot see a better way to put into practice everything that our hearts believe in, you know, to be able to uh, be and, and help facilitate the changes we wish to see. Uh, in the criminal justice system, one person at a time, one prosecutor one at a time, time. <laughs> one police department at yeah. a time. Well, we are out of time. I, I hope you come back many times to uh, continue this dialogue. Thank you so much. Thank you, Beatrice. And uh, this concludes uh, our episode of uh, Perspective of Global Justice Think Tech Hawaii. And uh, I see you in two weeks. <laughs> uh, we hope.